Hello, everyone. My name is Shannon Ozerny. I am the head of youth services at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. And it is my great pleasure to be your host for this very special Foundation Signature Series event with Tui T. Sutherland. I'll internally freak out. Okay. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the library has its home on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples and in particular recognize the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. The West Van Memorial Library Foundation Signature Series is brought to you, of course, by the Library Foundation and community supporters. This event is sponsored by Grosner and donor Jiwan Zhao. Thank you so much. A little bit about our foundation. The West Van Memorial Library Foundation believes that great libraries help build great communities. Donations to the foundation have supported projects like the lab, where we are right now, Booktopia, the literary arts festival for young people, our Friday night concert series, and so much more. And now our foundation is giving back to the community and thanks to many generous donations over the years, the Foundation Signature Series is here to help us all through this challenging time. This is such a bright spot, such an exciting thing to look forward to when some of our other plans may have changed. I also want to give a shout out to Kids Books, our official bookseller and sponsor for the All Ages Signature Series events. Kids Books has curbside pickup available at both their locations. So if you want to own a book by TUI, you can visit kidsbooks.ca to place your order or go into the store in North Vancouver or Vancouver. A little bit about our format today. Very shortly, I promise, very shortly, I will be welcoming Tui on screen. I'll have some questions for her, including what I think is a never before asked set of lightning round questions. And then I'll be passing on some of the questions that you emailed us in advance. We got dozens and dozens of questions, but thank you so much. And we'll also be pulling a couple from the live chat as well. I'm excited and I hope you're excited too. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Tui T. Sutherland. Tui is an author with astonishing range. She has written dozens of books for beginning readers, middle graders, teens. She writes it all, realistic fiction, humor, fantasy, adventure in both standalone stories and epic sprawling series. She writes under her own name with her own style and under different pen names in different styles. I feel like if she were an Olympic athlete, she would be one of those who won a medal in both the winter and the summer games. If she were a sandwich, she would be the peanut butter and the jelly. She truly does it all. And I also would like to mention that Tui very generously donated her speaking fee for this event back to the library so we could buy more Wings of Fire books and also dozens of titles by Black, Indigenous, and authors of color. So we are fully stocked here at the library and thanks to Tui for that. Now let's all take a big breath in through our nose and out through our mouths, hopefully no fire comes out. <sighs> and welcome Tui T. Sutherland. Hello Tui. Hi! How are, How are you doing you? this morning? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this oh. is my first real like online event since quarantine, so this is very exciting for me. <laughs> Fantastic. And how have you been doing over this time? How have you and your family been managing? Um, well, I feel like we're really lucky, actually. Like I, 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 I spend a lot of time going back and forth between feeling stressed about worrying about everybody else and then and just feeling like I want to like hide in a hole and then also wanting to go out and like take care of everyone but not knowing how to do that you know I'm sure everyone's having this um but I feel lucky because my husband and I both work from home anyway yeah. um and he's really good about especially taking the children in the morning so I can sleep and mm -hmm. then I can do my usual like middle of the night writing um and I also have kids that are like just the right age for um like entertaining themselves um, mm -hmm. but still wanting to be with us. Like, I feel like it would be a lot harder if they were like three and five and needed constant attention or if they were teenagers and like missed their friends so much. Like they do miss their friends, yeah. but they actually are, you know, they're, they're right now they're eight and 10 and they're, they're just the love 
obviously, is I love hanging out with them. So if I was going to be stuck in a house with anyone, <laughs> now I'm happy to do You that. mentioned middle of the night writing. So does that mean that you're still able to write during this time? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I sort of have to because of the yes. book 14 deadline. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and this, I, you know, I've been meaning to write a blog to explain all this to everybody too, because um, we were hoping originally that book 14 would come out in September of this year. Um, but that meant that I had to have it turned in at the end of March. And with everything that happened, there was just no way, um, you know, suddenly my children were home all day and I was figuring out like teaching them stuff. <laughs> so, um, so then, you know, uh, uh, so we had to push it back. I said, like, could I have until like the end of May? And they were really nice about it. And I was trying to do, yeah, the middle of the night writing. Um, but even so, like they tried to move it to December, but all the printers were like, it's actually impossible. Like we need this much leeway. And so Scholastic wanted you to have it sooner and I did too, but now it's been moved to March, um, but it is finished. It just is in the process of like editing, designing all the stuff that has to happen. Um, but, and you'll get it as soon as we can get it to you, basically. Well, you know, and that's something that I think I forget about, too, even working in a library. It's not just your writing, but it's the production, it's the printing, it's the distribution. So I think I can probably speak for everyone for saying thank you so much for still writing in April and May. I don't know. In April and May, I was still in whole mode. I was deep. <laughs> so the fact that you could even keep working on, on your book is, is fantastic. So it sounds like your piece is almost finished and it's going to actually go into production pretty quick to be ready for March. Yeah, that's what we're hoping is like, you know, um, I know we, we've seen sketches of the cover, which is going to be awesome. So we should have a finished cover soon. Um, and then it, there, all the pieces are getting better. Um, I hope I hope people like it. It's a little weird. It's definitely a weird one because um, I think everybody probably already knows that the protagonist of book 14 is Queen Snowfall of the Ice Wings. And she, up until now, has been kind of a, not necessarily a villain, but um, not a, I mean, she's, you know, one of Winter's antagonists. Like, he doesn't really like her. He's, she was her, his mean cousin, and then suddenly she became queen, actually because of a plague in the, uh, in the Ice Kingdom, which was, <laughs> which was another weird thing to be writing book 14 in the, like, where they're dealing with the aftermath math of plague and I was like it's like but we're not in the aftermath yet I don't know how to write this <laughs> right now so hopefully it, it works anyway but um but yeah so she has to go on, like a much longer journey to the where I wanted her character to get to than I think a lot of the other characters that I've written but hopefully people like her she's definitely like she's got her her perspective and she doesn't she's not hesitant to share it let's just say <laughs> that's exciting and you know what sometimes i find to kind of break up the weight there'll probably be a cover reveal at some point still this year and we were talking a little bit about how fantastic the audiobooks are for the series so if some of our viewers have read all the books and they're just like chomping at the bit going back and listening to them on audio is just an amazing experience oh yeah that yeah that's awesome and then oh and i the fourth graphic novel is still coming out this year, hopefully right. by December, I think. Right. And so, we are going to, we are definitely going to get into more. Um, I have lots about the future and future books and things that were sent in. So I will definitely get around to those. Um, but one thing I want to ask you about and something I've really appreciated about your books, especially recently, I think people know you for fantasy and world building, but your books are actually very hilarious in parts. Um, and I'm wondering if you ever make yourself laugh when you're writing. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I feel like it's weird to admit that I like that I make myself laugh. Um, it's usually when I go back and read something that I've written like a few weeks earlier and then forgotten about. And because um, sometimes I feel like I'm in this like other zone when I'm writing, like it's all just coming through me. And it's not to go back and read it that I'm like, oh, that I really like that. <laughs> Who wrote this? Um, and so I think that like there are definitely characters I love to write because they're funny. I love writing um, Cliff, who shows up in book eight, is one of my favorites. All of book eight, because it's Peril. And Peril, I, I find really fun to write. Um, I think, uh, you know, a Deathbringer. Anytime I get to write Deathbringer glory scenes, I I love writing the two of them. Um, and then Kibley and Winter. I kind, of, I kind of love writing their relationship, too, because it's, you know, Kibley is just trying to make Winter laugh, like all that it's it's hard but he's determined he's not giving up so 
Um, I also um, was wondering a little, little bit, it, uh, kind of related to humor, but um, what your stance is on hope. And what I mean by that is sometimes there's an assumption that, you know, the younger the audience for a book, the more hope that there has to be. And I'm wondering if you've ever had to go back and rewrite or, or um, kind of uh, brighten up some of your arcs because they too gloomy or dark or not hopeful enough? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I actually think hope is super important. It's what I look for in everything I read, even grown-up books. <laughs> um, and I think it's a reason that I don't write grown-up books because so many of the adult books I read are just kind of, they feel about, they, I, mean, I, I feel like I pick up a lot and they seem to be about adults who are stuck in some way. Um, whereas I feel like with young adults and children's books, there's a lot more um, potential to still change the world, to still make a difference and like find their destiny or whatever. Um, but yeah, no, I think it is. I mean, I feel like another thing about the Wings of Fire books is I'm, I'm you know, there can be darkness in the world. There's like a lot of, you know, grim things that happen, um, but the characters don't lose hope. And I feel like that's something I, I'm hoping that readers get as well, um, mm -hmm. is that sense that like we can hang in there and if, you know, as long as we take care of each other, maybe we'll all be okay. <laughs> um, and I think the one example um, wasn't in like, well, so uh, in, in writing the arc of the, the second arc, books six through 10, I'm going to try to do this without too many spoilers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Towards the end of book eight, I realized I had to write um, Darkstalker, which is the uh, the one that comes between book eight and ten, mm -hmm. um, because uh, I needed to figure out everything about Darkstalker's like origin story before I could get to what happens to him in books nine and ten. Um, and what I had originally sort of thought about um, happening in books nine and ten was something with clear sight, where. Uh, how do I put this? Like, we're, we're, <laughs> there was going to be like, I'll just say like a zombie clear sight. And it seemed, and it was going to be like creepy. Um, but then when I went back and wrote the dark soccer book, I'm so glad that Scholastic let me write it first because I realized as I was writing her story that I didn't want to do that to her. Um, that it was, and I loved writing her so much that I wanted her to have a more hopeful ending. And so giving her the hopeful ending at the end of book of dark soccer, um, also then led me to everything that happens in books 11 through 15. So I feel like it was actually a much better storytelling choice, like for driving the series forward than, um, than my original really terrible <laughs> dark idea. Um, so I think that, you know, I never actually wrote all of the, all of this, but it, I had thought about it and I'm glad that I didn't go there. If that makes sense. And something that you touched on, too, I think is hopeful doesn't necessarily mean simple, right? Hopeful doesn't necessarily mean something's lacking complexity. And sort of speaking of complexity, I know that you probably have many Word documents and things like that where you're keeping track of the world you've built. But I mean, we're getting up there in terms of the book series. How have your strategies change in terms of how you keep track of everything? Um, do you have just like a, a treasure trove of papers or post-its or, or how do you manage? Um, it's, it's Word documents mostly. It's like my computer, I have a whole Wings of Fire folder and then there's notes for each book. There's a list of the names and um, when I stay on top of it, I write down like what each name I've used for, like what that character, who that character is and how they're related to everyone else. But I also have um, a Word document that's just all, well, it was like all the, the first 12 books, just like all in one document. And then my computer got mad. It was like, you cannot do this. <laughs> it's too many pages. Um, but I used to be really useful because I could go in and search like if I knew what I was looking for, you know, um, yeah. I could search by that character's name and see if I figured out if I ever mentioned like what color their eyes are or something like that. Um, I will admit I've gone to the wiki online a couple of times um, to just to see like, did I actually mention this or anywhere? Or did, <laughs> do the readers know this about this dragon yet? And should I put it in? Um, or am I going to contradict myself? And I'm very impressed with, I try, you know, I try not to stay there too long because it feels very strange to be somewhere where everyone's talking about something I made. So I, I kind of want them to have that community for themselves and not worry about me being there. Mm -hmm. um, but I will go in sometimes and just be like, did I 
do, do we know whose father, who's, who, yeah, whose father is, stuff like that. <laughs> and please tell me you're backing up your computer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It's like the number one nightmare. I email things to myself all the time, like yeah. you know, in the middle of a thing. That's my other backup solution is in addition to the official backup thing that I don't always trust. I'm like, I, I, I send myself the document over email whenever I'm panicking about it. <laughs> and what's it like to live in a house with you? I mean, do you, are you just sort of muttering to yourself all day or, you know, throwing lamps when you're <laughs> writing certain arcs? Is your family as sort of immersed in this universe as you are just by virtue of, of living with you? Uh, that's very funny. <laughs> I would say they are. They're, um, I mean, so first of all, my children who are eight and 10 have not read the books. Um, oh. I know <laughs> my older one was like, mommy, it's starting to get a little embarrassing. <laughs> I was like, you are the person who can solve that problem. <laughs> and it's fine. I'm not in therapy about this or anything. <laughs> Um, but they, um, but they're very, you know, they're very sweet. They, they keep me grounded. Um, I definitely noticed that I have, that I go in waves where like, um, you know, they're, when I've just finished a book, uh, all I want to do is hang out with the kids and give them all, all my attention. And, you know, I feel like I've been neglecting them like during the deadline. So, um, so, I mean, and then especially like in March when everything shut down and it was suddenly like they were in a play that didn't end up happening. They were just about to go into tech week and they were so sad. Um, and the school was closed and everything was like falling apart. It felt like for them. So, um, so that was like, I had, I felt like I had to give them all my attention, but then as like the May deadline, um, I definitely get spacier. Like I lose track of conversations and um, they'll be like talking at the dinner table and they'll be like, mommy, are you listening? And I'm like, sure. My brain is totally here and not in a dragon world thinking about dragon things. Why is there um, maze on our spaghetti, mom? <laughs> <laughs> we can't eat staples in taco shells. <laughs> That's too funny. No, I will. My husband does most of the cooking. Okay. Our house, so <laughs> very lucky in that regard as well. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, that, and, but yes, everything else falls away. Like I don't, I don't, I'm at the best of times. I'm not great at like tidying up the house, but when I am on a deadline, like that completely doesn't happen. So, um, but I think that they, the kids enjoy knowing that, um, that their mommy like writes books and that, that, you know, other people have heard of them. They like it when I give them shout outs and like, you know, in interviews like this, yeah. they'll, they'll count how, which one of them I mentioned more times. Time, so I'm going to not mention either of them specifically <laughs> to keep myself out of trouble. <laughs> playing ground. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what your writing setup is? Are you stretchy pants curled up on a couch or are you regimented, no snack? I, I love hearing about, um, you know, what, what a writer's sort of creative cocoon looks like. Sure. I wish I could show it to you, um, but I'm actually not at home right now. Um, so this if you're wondering where I am, I'm, I, we have run away to my parents' cabin in the woods. Um, and I, it's, and I'm in their attic. So it's, I mean, I can actually show you some of it. It's like this, um, it's like a real attic. Like I'm, oh. <laughs> and there's a, there's a lake outside so the children can swim a lot, which is great because, um, they need to be outside every but they also hate getting hot which is just like me like I hate I hate being hot so um so we can just throw them in the lake every day and that cheers them up <laughs> um, little mud wings <laughs> or sea wings yeah totally yes, yes, yeah oh. <laughs> exactly so they um yeah so they yeah so they so it's really nice to to be because I'm not in my office and it is harder to write here so I'm glad I was able to finish book 14 before we came um but uh, normally I'm in my office at home. I have this like this tiny little room, but it's full of dragon pictures. Um, I have printouts of some of the original covers on the walls to look at, uh, or like over my desk and a map of Pyrea. Um, but then I also have some fan art that people have given me, which, oh my gosh, it's unbelievable how talented people are with their art and their, um, and all the things that I've gotten over the years. It's just like, I wish I could create art like that. Like, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm, I can't draw at all. And they have little sculptures and stuff too. So, um, so that around me. And then I have like shelves of like my favorite books and the books I've written. Like I have a couple shelves of writing books. Um, and normally like my process is like, I get something, uh, you know, like if it's the middle of the day, it's coffee. If it's late at night, it's tea, chocolate. And, um, and I go sit in an office and I, 
I have to go through like a little ritual of um, like reading just like three authors I follow on Twitter, <laughs> just read them and then turn off Twitter and, uh, and, and start. Um, the other thing I do to kind of get myself ready to write is I do the New York Times crossword puzzle. Um, because I feel like it helps me start thinking about words, like, you know, that that moment of like, what's the word I'm looking for here? It turns on that part of my brain. So that's kind of the last thing I do before I start writing. Oh, and do you do it on paper or do you do the minis on your phone? I'm addicted to the minis on my phone. Oh, no, I do it on the computer, like on, on oh, the, yeah. okay. really easily. And also, I, I mean, I'm not super strict with myself. So I, I, I let myself like check, like, is this word right? Is this word? Like, I don't, <laughs> I feel like it's not about being like amazing at doing crossword puzzles. It's about just waking up my brain. So it's okay. Yeah. What a great, I haven't heard of that, of an author doing that before. And it makes so much sense, right? It's literally the equivalent of doing a brisk walk before you break out in a sprint. If you're, <laughs> if you're running now, this people are going to be like Shannon ask more wings of fire question. I have one more crossword question for you. When you finish the crossword on the computer on the New York Times site, does it make a really satisfying noise like it does on the app? It does. It's like, oh, I love it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I'm so proud every time. And in fact, if I have my, my sound on mute so it doesn't make the noise, I'm really disappointed. I know. Well, well, for what it's worth, anyone who's watching, you can download the app and you get to do the mini on the current day for free. So anybody can do a mini. Um, if you do it under 20 seconds, you're a hero. Um, yeah, I love doing that. Wait, one more thing. I also, um, <laughs> I used to not have a subscription because you could get three free puzzles a week. Um, yeah, I can. I, <laughs> I, I, I got into the point where my deadlines were so crazy that I needed to subscribe. So I'd have one every day. <laughs> And they're fun to do as a family, too. I mean, I've even, you know, been over to friends' houses and stuff where it, it's a fun thing to do as a family just to, to do a crossword together. So I've got my uh, kids. My kids are hooked on the spelling bee. This is a crossword stan interview is what this <laughs> is. This is, uh, this is what you didn't know is you're logging on to hear about uh, TUI and a librarian in Canada talk about crosswords. Um, I have a couple more just sort of writing related for you. Um, one thing in West Vancouver, where uh, where I'm in right now, uh, our West Van school, West Vancouver school system is really into self-regulation, not self-control, self-regulation, just kind of working on strategies where that can help us focus, um, help us sort of apply ourselves to a task. Do you have any kind of strategies that you use to get yourself in the mood for writing besides the crossword, um, anything that just sort of helps with your mental health. Um, and uh, because what you do takes so much of your, your brain. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I love the idea that the schools are focusing on that because I, I wish I'd had more of that, the kid. I definitely got into a pattern of doing everything the night before something was due, um, which you can't do with a 300 page book. I have just <laughs> So, um, so I, I kind of wish I'd built up more of those skills earlier in life. Um, but I, I guess now I do a little bit of trying to figure out like, okay, I have a month left and I have 30,000 more words to write. That means at least a thousand words a day, you know, um, and then try to like not stop until I've hit those thousand words, even if they're not great. And I know I can fix them. Um, just like, you know, kind of powering through. I also that if I start writing, like if I write, if I tell myself like, you know what, I'm super tired, I'm just gonna write one sentence and then go to bed, often just writing that sentence will either spark the next sentence or it will um, at least get the book going again in my head so I can think about it as I'm falling asleep. Mm -hmm. um, I guess for, I definitely, I have days where it's just really hard to get myself to go upstairs and write. Um, I find that um, reading is actually really helpful. Like I, you know, one thing I, I've been trying to do is instead of checking Twitter, I, I sit and read like a chapter of the book I'm reading. Um, and that helps me like get into a more sort of um, like writery brain. Um, I also, I, you know, I, I mentioned I have this whole bookshelf full of writing books um, and I love rereading them. And I love just like having a book by an author that I need, uh, that I love like talking about their writing. Um, and that can be, that can be really, Really helpful. I did a book about like two writers with writer's block and thinking about like what they were going through and how they were sparking ideas for themselves made me feel like, oh, I could do this too. And now I want to write that. And it was, you know, so it's very, it's helpful for me to like read about other writers, I think. 
Do you have one writing book that you find yourself going back to again and again? And we probably have some viewers who maybe are interested in becoming writers themselves. Is there one that's been particularly useful? I think one of my favorites from when I first started out um, is called Take Joy by Jane Yolen. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Um, and it was especially like, I haven't read it in a few years, but when I was first thing out, it talked so much about like remembering that you love writing and focusing on enjoying the process of writing instead of just needing to get to the end and selling it and like becoming famous, you know? <laughs> so it, it was very, um, it was great for making me feel like I remembered why I wanted to do this in the first place. You know, it was very, um, it would it would help me sort of refocus on the writing part of it. And then another one that I've mentioned before, it, it's not really a writing book, but it's um, a collection of letters that John Steinbeck wrote to his editor while he was working on his books. And what's like, I loved reading those because um, he would write every Monday through Friday and then he would take the weekends off. And you could see on Friday, he would be like, oh, I feel great. This book is going awesome. Everything is fabulous because he'd been writing for five days in a row. And then on Monday, he'd be like, oh, I'm so tired. And this book is terrible. And I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> and I was like, you got to write every day, John. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> Stop enjoying your weekends. Um, but it's, you know, it's very relatable. It's like even him, like he had he had days where he was just like, let me just talk about my pencil for a while because I don't feel like going to my book yet. Um, and he would do this every day before he'd start writing. He would do this letter to his editor. Oh, cool. And do you, have you had the same editors throughout the entire um, series? Uh, for Wings of Fire, yes, which yes. is rare and yeah. just like a blessing. Like I'm so, and I love her. I, my editor's name is Amanda. Shout out um, to Amanda. <laughs> Shout out to Amanda. Who is the best? We actually um, used to work together when I worked in publishing. We were, um, I think, assistant editors at the same time or associate. We were like, you know, kind of up and coming in publishing. Um, she's a writer too. She actually has a couple of young adult books out that are wonderful. She's um, it's Amanda Maciel, if anyone wants oh. to look her up. Oh, um, she's your editor? Yeah, she's my editor. Oh, <laughs> She's awesome. She is oh, awesome. I had no idea. That's so cool. Uh, and she's just like, she really gets the books and she writes the nicest emails about them. That's like, I'm a Leo. So I respond very well to people telling me they like the books. <laughs> so every letter she sends me where she's like, this book was the best. I'm like, okay, thank you. Now I can write again. <laughs> um, and she's just also just has really smart, things to say about each of the books and I've just I can't believe I've been lucky enough to stay with her the whole way through that's fantastic in terms of what ends up on the cutting room floor um are there hundreds of words we don't see thousands of words we don't see um I guess what I'm wondering is is how much wings of fire content exists in the universe that we <laughs> need to never get to read or whatever um, child grows up to be your archivist, um, because that a little plug for librarianship here. Uh, what is it to be your archivist in five, ten, or twenty years? Oh my gosh! I hope it's not too overwhelming. There's a there's a lot of nonsense. So one of my tricks is like I you know I growing up I was really bad at editing myself. I would be like, no, every sentence is perfect. Every word is exactly the way it should be after I wrote it. Right. Um, and then being an editor really helped me learn how to look at my books and like revise them and get way better at that. Um, but it's still kind of hard. So as I'm writing, what I'll do, do is feel like I need to cut something. I move it to a separate document that's like wings of fire or book team bits yep. is what I call it. So I, <laughs> so for each book, there's a document that's just like random stray sentences and words um, that are just like that I've like snipped out of the book. I don't know if any of them would be helpful, like storytelling wise, but I guess the archivist could find probably a few scenes in there that have been totally changed. Right. Um, and I hear lots of viewers screaming at their computer, release the bits. <laughs> we want the bits. <laughs> no, they don't make any sense. I promise. <laughs> They're out for a reason. But one thing that, uh, that some fans do know about is um, the pro the epilogue for book 10 was originally a lot longer. Um, for book 10. Um, and as you can see, this book was already pretty long. Um, and I had written it in a very like, here's, I it went through all 10 of the previous characters and was like, here's where they are now. And like, here's their little happily ever after kind of. And um, Amanda did say like, but isn't there a book 11? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're not allowed to write this like 
final epilogue now, but she let me do the the five from books six through ten and instead. And so I kind of wove some of what you'd seen from the others into those into those five. So you see, like part of Clay's scene was mm -hmm. the, I just rewrote it from Peril's point of view and then put them together. Um, so it so it, you're not missing a lot. That was definitely that's the probably the biggest thing that I can think of that was that was cut out for a reason. Cool. And, <laughs> well, before I get into audience questions, I need to ask you, um, I need to get to the lightning round because I can't, um, I can't do any interview without a lightning round. Um, so this is very simple. I am going to ask you a question and you, it's sort of free association. Um, whatever character or dragon tribe first comes to mind, that's your answer. So I, think you'll, I think we'll get the sense of it very quickly. And don't take time to think. We're, we're going to delve deep into Tui Sutherland's psyche here. Oh, um, <laughs> so name the character or dragon tribe you would let babysit your kids. Um, does it have to be a short answer? Can I tell no, you? no. Just, give me whatever. <laughs> give me, yeah. Okay. So my first thought is like, who are the best moms in the series? Probably Queen Thorn. But mm -hmm. ooh, if I wanted someone to babysit, um, maybe Queen Coral. She's not a great mom, but oh boy, would she keep my kids safe? She would probably like tie my children to her, and that would be fine. But really, actually, it would probably be Clay. I think Clay. Oh, would be Clay would be Clay would be the best Manny. Um, he would be fun, and he would take really good care of them, and they would love him. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right. So name the character or dragon tribe you would not want to sit next to on the bus. <laughs> Ugh, well, I've only had to ride the bus once in my life when we lived in Miami briefly in seventh grade, and it was awful. It was a year of riding with a bunch of incredibly mean children who I'm sure grew up to be lovely, but were dreadful at the time. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say this. But um, so I think of all the mean girls in the series. So I would say like fierce teeth, Queen Scarlet and Icicle are probably the three closest to the people that I experienced riding the bus with. <laughs> Good question. We were talking about how I love Queen Scarlet's fashion, but, you know, not somebody you want to be chilling with on the bus. Okay. <laughs> Character or dragon tribe you think would be the most fun to go trick-or-treating with? Um, I think Kinkajou. Because I, Kinkajou would be really into it. But oh, she'd be so excited about <laughs> trick or treating candy. Oh my gosh, are you kidding? Um, sure, the yeah. raisins. Yeah, yeah, and she could totally also like change her costume for like each each house probably if she wanted to. <laughs> Love it. Um, character or tribe you think would like sushi the most? Uh, the sea wings, because yeah. that's basically what they eat anyway. <laughs> True. I think I just really wanted sushi when I was writing these questions. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had sushi. It has been a long time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, sushi and there's so many things. Um, all right. I want to get to audience questions. Can't get to all of them because we would be here. We'd be here until Halloween. Um, but we're going to get through uh, as many as possible. Thank you to everybody who sent some in advance. We're going to start with the one sent in advance. And then I've got my colleague, Sarah, here uh, noting questions from the chat. Um, so this question is from a caring young fan and their sister who wants to know, have you been taking frequent breaks? It's important to keep mentally healthy. Oh, thank you. What a lovely question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, so the last, last month of trying to finish book 14, I was definitely like pushing really hard. And I kept imagining like, as soon as this is done, I'm going to my parents' cabin and I'm going to sit in the hammock and just read for a month and not do anything else. So. I couldn't take breaks while that was happening, but I can now. This is my like recovery time. So I actually like, I, I have a whole stack of books I've been reading. My my son just finished Starcrossed. Oh. Which he loved so much. So I read it too. And it's really sweet. It's like yeah. creators putting on a Romeo and Juliet story. And um, and then like the, the girl who's been cast as Romeo has a crush on the one who plays Juliet. And like, it's really, really cute. It's just a lovely story. Well, I hate and to I break it to you. You are working right now on your vacation. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate it. <laughs> this is like, you know, we get to talk about, uh, I just, I love being like with you guys. So this is fun for me. Um, 
I also just finished my plain Jane, which is her Jane Eyre retelling. Have you read yes. this one, Shannon? Yes. Is that the, um, that's not my Lady Jane. Is that the one by three authors or I'm getting it mixed up or something else? No, you're totally right. My okay, was, yeah. was their first one. And then my plain Jane is the second one they wrote. Yes. So, the, so that one was Lady Jane Grey and this one is Jane Eyre. Yeah. They're it's awesome. It's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> offered by I was stuck for some reason like Tui this is how deep I, I am into this series that I thought of three female authors I'm like oh maybe it's authored by Blaze Blister and Burn like this is how deep <laughs> this is how deep I'm I've been dreaming about dragons preparing for this do you dream about dragons that's a good question I did I do dream about dragons <laughs> I mean I dream about the characters I dream about writing the characters but I don't yeah. I don't have a lot of dreams where I'm a dragon or interacting with dragons. That would be great, I've, though. I kind of wish I did. <laughs> I never have dreamed about. I mean, I read the I read the first few books years ago, but I was you know re-listening to them on audio to prepare for this. I've been full on dreaming about dragons. Um, so, if anybody <laughs> in the chat is also dreaming about dragons, let us know, and we'll call a helpline together. Um, okay, let's get back back to the questions um, from uh, a very talented artist who sent in one of their original dragon um, drawings, which thank you so much for that. I will send it to you, Tui. Um, do you ever get writer's block? And if so, what do you do about it? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's two, there's, there, I feel like there's two kinds of writer's block. There is um, where you're writing along in the story and then you hit a point where you just don't know what should happen next, um, where it's, you know, or, or often what happens with me is I have like big scenes in my head but I need to figure out the transition from one to the other. Um, I used to say when I was starting out that uh, it, these felt like walking across the room scenes where it was like, oh, it's so boring. They're just walking across the room until I can get them to the next scene, right? Um, so that's something I feel gotten a little better at as I've written a lot of them, like figuring out how to make even those transition scenes interesting by, um, you know, adding dialogue often that, that will sort of illuminate the characters. Someone was like someone in my writing group back when I was in a writing group said each scene should either like move the plot forward or tell you something about the character or be funny. And so, you know, focusing on that, like uh, figuring out like why is this scene in here and like can it tell us something that I need to put in somewhere anyway, even if it's just like the characters flying from one place to the other. Um, that will help with things like that where I'm just trying to get to the next part of the book. Um, also, asking myself questions. Um, or something my my readers have probably noticed is some, often what I'll do is just add another character. <laughs> I'm like, let's have someone show who like causes trouble, um, and that, that always helps sort of get the story started again. I feel, or if it's not a new character, then it has to be Kinkajou because Kinkajou will like get the story going again. Usually, she's like, what are we doing? Sitting around? Time to go see <laughs> So That's that, such a good point, though. We don't really those those just read so effortlessly to us, you know. It's it's like the uh, the the paste in between the bricks that you don't see or don't think about, but really are needed to to make the whole novel this seamless experience. Yeah, and to try and make it not feel slow at any yeah. point. Like if I ever feel like I'm kind of bored, then I'm then I know the reader will be. So I have to go back and be like, what would make this more interesting? And I feel like the other kind of writer block is um it's just feeling too like tired to write or too sort of unenthusiastic to write you know and I and that definitely happens to me where I'm like I just it's been a long day and I just want to I just want to go watch tv <laughs> so um I find what ha what helps with that can be um like talking to myself like I'll, I'll often corner my poor husband and be like let me talk to you about where I am in this story and what should happen next so I can get excited about it again um or I've talked about this before, but I, I have a writing journal mm -hmm. that is, um, it's like another document that I just open and I'll start writing there where I'll just start like complaining about whatever is wrong with the book right now. <laughs> oh my God, when the archivist finds that, I better be dead. Because <laughs> it is like nonsense. It's just me being like, oh, these characters are the worst. Turtle, oh, why are you so dreadful? <laughs> Poor Turtle. Turtle got it was in for a lot of abuse in book nine because he just really did not want to save the day. And um, I mean, as for his name, just wanted to go hide under a rock. And I was like, I know, but come on, man. <laughs> so I find that writing about it often like helps me figure out what to do next and get me like gets me like, oh, okay. So 
that's the other thing. Sorry, archivist, that it's going to be a lot of them will like end in mid sentence because I'll suddenly realize what I need to do and like rush off to the actual park <laughs> and start right now. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, all right. Do you know how far into the series you're going with the graphic novels? Um, I. Oh, with the graphic novels. Yes. I, yes, I'm hoping that we get to do all of them. I know we're working on books four and five right now. Um, I mean, I think we haven't officially decided we're doing all of them, but it seems like people like them. Yeah. And um, I would love to see book 11. Like, I can't wait to get to the Silk Wings and um, everything on that continent. So I think that'll be really fun. Although I keep writing, I'll pause and be like, oh my gosh, the poor graphic novelist who has to draw this. Um, I mean, poor Mike, hopefully Mike will stay with us, like, <laughs> all the way to the carnivorous, like, hang in there. <laughs> Throw Mike a bone. Um, <laughs> do you know who the protagonist of book 15 is yet? And any chance could know. Um, I, I think I do know, but I, I haven't gotten permission from Amanda to tell anyone yet. So I probably shouldn't say. Fair enough. That's the things that we like save to reveal to kind of like yeah. help fill in the, the long, terrible time. Until the book comes out. <laughs> and the good thing is the fact that you know means that we will get to know soon. If you didn't even know, then the wait would be long. So this is good. I I, I hear people groaning, but I, <laughs> this is good news. Um, this next question is uh, from someone who signed their email. Some kid lying in a bed reading books like a nerd. I'm with this kid. Who among us? Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> That's the best sign off. Uh, first, they have a comment. Hi, I got into Wings of Fire a few months ago and I'm hooked. I'm eagerly awaiting the next book. Thank you. Thank you, Tui, for this amazing series. Their question is, will there be an arc four? Uh, that's a great question. It's often hard for me to kind of figure that out until I'm yeah. close to the end of the arc I'm doing. So, uh, so now is actually when I should start figuring that out. Because um, if, if there is, then I need to set it up a little bit in book 15. Um, there are other stories I want to write in this world. I'm just not 100% sure yet if it's going to be another five books or if it'll be, I, I feel like there's there's a place for the Dragon Slayer, um, the one that just came out with the humans. Like I kind of, <laughs> poor Amanda, I was, I was um, when I sent it to her and she read the epilogue, oh, this is what I was afraid we were going to do. It's like, make me want another one of these. And I was like, well, <laughs> hopefully. So I do have ideas for that. And then I also... I have ideas for things I want to do with the younger dragons. Like I've mentioned this before, but I would love to do like a younger, not 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 the not that the book would be younger, but that the characters would be younger. What I want to do is something where like Cliff and Ocklet and Keisner, like and maybe Bumblebee, um, have an adventure together. I have it in my, my head. I have to figure out how to make it work. So we'll see. Hopefully there'll be more Wings of Fire in some form. Anyway, after your vacation, TBD. <laughs> Right. After to, be, to be dragoned. Um, I knew it was a matter of time before I did a pun. Um, and that was a weak one. I should have said burning questions or something. Anyway, uh, let's see. Next question um, from a fan in West Vancouver. Um, they want you to know Wings of Fire is their all time favorite series. They're wondering, do you have any plans to end the series or are you still in it? It's still wide open. The adventure will still continue. Well, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, I, I have a lot of, I mean, I think kind of the fun part about writing this is that um, because each book is a different character, it does feel like there's all these other stories in the world. Um, it's actually one of the things I love about the fan fiction, um, even though I feel like I shouldn't read it because I don't want to accidentally steal someone's ideas. I love that everyone, I want everyone to feel like your dragon is in this world. Your dragon has a story going on that's just as important as the ones that I'm writing, you know, that's, um, that could be happening anywhere. So, you know, whatever I write, um, I also want everybody to feel like they can write their own stories too. So, and I, it does leave me with all these, like, you know, I don't want to forget certain characters. There's others that I want to come back to and tell you what happened to them. So I'm not sure yet, but I definitely, I don't feel like I'm completely done with Wings of Fire yet. And I just, I'm so excited that you're so excited about it and you're still in and, and as long as you, as long as you still have stories to tell and are pumped about it, you know, that's, that's kind of the perfect situation. You know, you're not this grizzled 125 year old person who's just like, no, <laughs> Amanda, no. <laughs> Take the dragons away. Yeah. 
<laughs> I do have other books I want to write, though. Actually, that's the uh, hard thing. Yeah. You know, I, I have ideas in this world, but I also have other things I'd love to get to at some point um, before they all leave my head. So, um, so we'll see. I should be, this is the summer where I should start figuring all that out. I think what we all need to do is we need to start a GoFundMe to simply clone you. We need, we need <laughs> five or six Tuis, um, or even just your brain in a little, in a little jar <laughs> with a typewriter attached. <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be so weird. Like what would, what would they all come up with? Oh my goodness. Amazing stuff. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite dragon couple? Ooh. I think probably like my two favorites are like the real canon couples. So like Glory and Deathbringer, I love writing. And then Sundu and Willow is one of my very favorites. I, I love writing them together. Um, uh, another fan wants to, uh, is wondering how you feel knowing that so many queer fans are seeing themselves represented so well in your books, especially The Poison Jungle. This person says, I have never been more excited uh, to see two female dragons in a loving relationship. It makes me feel so safe and happy in the Wings of Fire universe. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Like, that's exactly what I want. I want them to feel welcome. Like, I sort of, I've talked before about how, you know, I was able to, like, this is my, my fantasy world. Mm -hmm. So I was able to make it all dragon queens. That's one thing. But I also wanted it to be sort of this utopian LGBTQ world where, like, like any Megan can be whatever they are for real and nobody judges them for it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and that's, it's just part of their real life. Like I felt like there should be more fa fantasy worlds like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more real worlds yeah. like that. And the, the real world should just be like that. Um, so, I mean, I just, and I also feel I've been working in publishing for such a long time and to see the progress in what we're allowed to put in our books um, and the support from the, the publishing company about that. Like I actually had a queer couple in my very first novel, which is This Must Be Love. Um, it's just like sort of in the background. It's her mom has run on another woman. Um, and I kind of put it in there and my editor was like, well, okay, as long as we don't talk about it, you know. Um, and now I can have it like the centerpiece of the story and like they can just be happy and be who they are. And my editor was like, I love it from the very first mention of it, I think in book six, um, you know, she was like, yes, we can definitely do this. And we should definitely do this. Um, and so it makes me happy that, you know, publishing has a ways to go, but we've come so far in just like the 20 years I've been working in publishing. Um, and it's so, I just, I want, I want kids to find more stories like that and to feel seen and to feel that they can tell those stories themselves. Um, and we know that we love them just the way they are. <laughs> well, they, I, I love that you created a world where, you know, someone can die the next minute and, and laugh the next, but we all feel safe no matter what. That's, that's the kind of the beauty of this series is that, and what I try to explain sometimes to parents who haven't read it, it's like, you feel, you feel safe, um, amidst all of this happening to you so much as the storyteller so um thank you to this fan for writing in and thank you Tui for doing the writing um oh my gosh I have so many questions here I'm going to actually I think we can go over to the chat um let's see here oh here we go um oh my gosh this is a lot of questions <laughs> this is great um do you know of the fan-made game on Roblox? One of the creators is here on the live chat. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. So I haven't seen it because my kids don't play Roblox yet, but yeah. I have been sent screenshots of it from my friends whose kids do play it, um, and they love it. They just are so impressed with it, and it sounds amazing. I'm, I'm kind of just in awe that someone is out there creating something that wonderful. Like, it sounds really cool. So thank you <laughs> for doing that. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, what do you do when you're not writing? You talked a little bit about reading, spending time with your kids, any other crosswords, any other hobbies or things you like to do? Oh man, uh, that really feels like my entire life. It's like <laughs> <laughs> now maybe. Writing and hanging out with the kids. Um, what do we do? We're, um, we're all really into musicals. So um, my my younger son, especially, but all of us, we've been doing in the quarantine, we've been um, like tracking a lot of like Broadway stuff happening. I mean, well, like everybody, we watched Hamilton as soon as it came out on Disney. I actually have my, um, I got a Hamilton mask. So that's like extra cool. <laughs> <laughs> I got them for the kids too, because I was like, well, this is how we'll actually end up like wearing our masks. 
Um, and then today, actually, we did a um, like an online uh, the Shakespeare's Globe in London does these online story times. They tell the whole story of the play. Like today, it was Twelfth Night, and so um, so I actually got up earlier than I normally would because it's two thirty for them, but it's nine thirty for me, which was horrible. <laughs> But I dragged myself out of bed, um, and it was great. The kids loved it. Like they, she's the woman telling the story was really funny, and it was very interactive. So I feel like this is my my favorite thing is it, uh, that we found in quarantine is ways to like um, connect with places and and, and authors too um, that are doing stuff remotely that we wouldn't normally get to see. But now it's online, so yeah. Pretty awesome. One of the most asked questions we have, and I'm sure you know what it is. It's two letters. The first letter is T. The second letter is B. And it's the TV series. <laughs> Can you tell us anything about it? How involved you are? Um, even just, you know, pat our heads and as we quiver in anticipation. <laughs> um, so, okay, let me think. The, the last time I, I connected with them was um, like when I was in the middle of book 14. So, everyone has been really lovely and they did say like, it's okay, go write book 14. We can talk after you're done. Um, I know they're busily doing stuff. I think they're working on like character concepts and um, finding a place for it because, you know, we have Ava DuVernay working as the executive producer and she's like so cool. Um, you lose your mind when you heard that? I lost my mind and I'm not even you. <laughs> I totally did. I was just like, what? Um, and she's just, and she's also just like really, I'm mean, very like she just has so many wonderful ideas and talks I just love her I love her so much um and I'm very excited like what she can bring to it as well that um you know will make it sort of its own wonderful new thing and then yeah. the two uh writers that I know are working on it um Dan and Krista are just the loveliest people and they really care about the books like their daughter has read all the books and so they have two and so they're like they're into it they they're you know I trust them I get it yeah so, um, so I don't know, I mean, they did, everyone has told me like, try not to get anyone too excited because it's a very long process animation. I'm sure it's even longer, the pandemic, but also maybe one of the few TV shows that could happen during a pandemic. I don't know. So uh, don't quote me. <laughs> but I, I, so I, I know there's a lot that goes into it. Animation takes a very long time. So. And it's good to know there's movement, there's momentum, it hasn't totally stalled, that there's still, um, I know with some of these projects, you can, you know, you'll never hear about them ever again, but this one sounds like it's, it's rolling along, so. It's true. I mean, I have, I've, I've told my own kids who are excited um, that I feel like making anything into a TV show or movie is like a 20-step process, and we're on like step five now, so there's a ton of other stuff that has to happen. We have to find the right home for it, and the uh, and sort of, you know, piece it all together. But I feel like the most important pieces are coming into, are like, are, are, are in it already. So I'm, I'm excited. I think it'll, I think it'll be cool. You know, yeah, I, I think. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you, um, oh, this is a great question. Um, what is your favorite hated or underrated character? Is there one that you know that people don't really like or even don't really talk about much that you're kind of keen on? That's a great question. Oh man, I'm looking at my books trying to think of somebody. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, there are characters that I want to get back to, but I don't oh. think anybody necessarily. I mean, the other thing is that I, I don't spend a lot of time reading stuff online. So if there are characters that are really hated, I probably wouldn't want to know about it. <laughs> Who would you like to get back to, like, um, or revisit? Oh, well, Umber. I feel bad that Umber and Sora, like, kind of flew off at the end of book six, and then we just haven't seen them again. But I know they're out there. Like, I know, I, I, I kind of know what's happening to them. But, um, and then, I'll, oh, well, <laughs> one of my favorite characters that I, would love to work back into the series is actually the little octopus in Darkstalker, uh, Blob. <laughs> I, know. I know it's random. But... That's your picture book. <laughs> <laughs> Adventures of Blob. What Blob's been doing in lots of years. <laughs> that was unexpected. Question. I feel like I should have a better answer, but I can't. <laughs> no, I think, I think 
think that's fantastic. <laughs> so we actually have um, one small order of business, which is um, our draw for our kids books gift certificates. Um, to enter the draw, um, these were, um, this is a list of everybody who had pre-registered as of about 10 a.m. this morning. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to enter the draw, it's okay. We are going to be doing another draw for our Kazu Kibuishi event that's happening on August 13th. But Tui, what I need from you is to pick a number between 1 and 115. Okay. Um, 82. Oh. Let's see here. Number 82, there's a lot of entries. Well, there's 115. Okay, number 82, this is Chloe. Chloe, you want a gift certificate? I will get in touch with you. There may be more than one Chloe watching, so if you are a Chloe who gets an email from me or a phone call from me, you are the winner. If you are a different Chloe, then you don't get a gift certificate, but you get a beautiful name. Um, <laughs> Tui, I need you to pick one more number between 115. Um, 21. 21. Oh, that is Annika. Annika, you will hear from me. And one more time, Tui, if you don't mind. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, 16. One of the 115, I already forgot. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, 16. 16. All right. That is Christina. Christina, if you're the Christina, you will hear from me. <laughs> um, before we say goodbye, I want to slide in just one more question. Um, is there any continent that we don't know of or any scrapped ideas for continents in your world? Oh, um, well... It's hard because I don't want to say scrapped idea in case there's anything I come back to. That's a good um, point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will say that, like, when I started thinking about um, the insect tribes, the silk wings and the hive wings, um, I guess the one thing I didn't do was, um, or that I intentionally did, is I didn't use any spider names in case I wanted to do a spider tribe later. Or, but that might also never happen. So that I guess that's one of them. That's like a... <laughs> That I'm trying to remain unbiased and like, you know, <laughs> like I'm okay with spiders. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I'm with you. Well, I, I gotta say, if I was comparing spiders and wasps, I think wasps are worse. At least spiders eat the horrible. I know. Like, it's not a mystery. rational fear. <laughs> There was a, a there was a, a a little spider friend in the bathtub with me just a couple nights ago, uh, oh, no. and that's why I'm this pale. <laughs> I'm still recovering. <laughs> um, all right, Tui, we are just about out of time. I want to say thank you so so much for doing this. Um, thank you. This is so much fun. <laughs> on vacation in an attic. Um, <laughs> we are so grateful to you. And also thank you for helping us get so many books into the hands of kids in our community. Um, that has made a huge impact for us. I also want to say again, thank you to the West Van Memorial Library Foundation who made this event happen. If you've watched and you've enjoyed, please let us know. Um, you can get in touch with us on the email address you'll see at the very end of this slide, or you can leave a comment in in the description. Um, I hope you'll join us again on Thursday, August 13th at 11 a.m. Pacific for our second signature series event with Kazu Kibuishi. And of course, you can check out all of the events that we have running for all ages at wvml.ca slash signature. Tui, you're one of my favorite scavengers. <laughs> <laughs> you too, Shannon. I feel the same thank, way. <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Bye for now.